Greetings, friends and brethren and anyone that's listening. Um, I'm glad to be here. Uh, I've had some things this year happen to me, but we all go through things. Like my mother said, being an orphan, I'm glad I'm alive. And uh, I'm sure you are too, and we're here to rejoice, and we're having a good feast. Had a bad day yesterday. I didn't even get to show up to church. That's another story, but I apologize because I sure wanted to hear all the sermons. That's the first time I've missed in years. But uh, I'm here today, and I want to greet everyone. Uh, the subject I'm going to talk about today uh, is very important for every person in this room and everyone that hears this sermon. It's for people who aren't Christians, and especially for people who are Christians. Every one of you deals with this subject, and I've gave this subject, you know, in a short form to my son who was having a bad day, and uh, it helped him, my oldest son. He's 54 years old, and I hope it helps you. I hope not what I have to say, but the scriptures. If you want to write them down, that's okay. Uh, if you just want to listen, and then you can go back and look up the scriptures, but please remember God's word is sacred. God's word is to instruct everyone in the ways of God, and we're to learn so we can help people in the wonderful world tomorrow. Uh, the title of my sermon is Forgiveness for the Kingdom. On the morning of October 2nd, 2006, the unthinkable descended on a sleepy little town. Something snapped in the mind of a 32-year-old milk truck driver in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, an area known for its Amish population, suffering from apparent and unexpected mental illness. The truck driver wrote out suicide notes for the wife and his three children. In one note, he mentioned the unresolved rage he felt against God for the death of his infant daughter. Then he loaded a nine millimeter handgun and other weapons in his truck and set out for a one room schoolhouse in the old order Amish community of Nickel Mines. The trucker now a gunman took 10 young Amish girls hostage at the tiny schoolhouse, allowing other adults and young boys to escape. He told some that he wanted to revenge against God. Then the Dar situation became horrific. Just 30 minutes after the hostage situation began, the gunmen unexpectedly opened fire on the helpless young girls who were between the ages of 6 and 13. Two minutes later, as police stormed the school, the assailant turned the gun on himself. Two girls died instantly. Three others died shortly afterwards. Five miraculously survived. The community and soon the people of America were stunned, horrified, and outraged. Any school shooting was horrible enough, but the thought of innocent young children of an old Amish order group being murdered in cold blood was too much. Yet out of this darkness came a light, a free, freeing way of thinking and living in line with that laid out to us long before in the pages of scripture, an unexpected reaction. As both locals and people around the world tried to make sense of the awful event that had happened, an unexpected miracle began to take place. A grieving grandfather one of the, one of the murdered girls wanted other family members not to fall prey to hatred, stating we must not think evil of this man. Astonishingly, unrelenting forgiveness swelled up from the Amish community. Amish neighbors intentionally sought out members of the shooter's family to express comfort and forgiveness. Some visited the shooter's widow, his parents, and his in-laws. A private fund was set up for the family of the shooter. The result, a sea of wonder washed over the community. In the face of unspeakable horror, this response of love from the grieving Amish overwhelmed all who heard about it. Instead of focusing on the horrible details of the event, 2,400 media about forgiveness erupt around the planet. Ann Rogers, Pittsburgh Post-Gazette, September 20, 2007. The widow of the shooter later wrote an open letter to her Amish neighbors. Your love for our family has helped to provide the healing we so desperately need. 
gifts you've given have touched our hearts in a way no words can describe. Your compassion has reached beyond our family, beyond our community, and is changing our world. And for this, we sincerely thank you. Quoted by Damon McRelroy, The Daily Telegraph, October 6, 2006. I've read this story several times. Each time, I only sh shudder at the heart and the horror that happened there. But I'm, I'm speechless at times at the reaction of the Amish community and the families of the victims. I've asked myself, how would I react? Could I ever forget such senseless horror perpetrated against my loved ones and the permanent loss? This level of forgiveness is totally out of the sphere of human nature and behavior and the reaction. We as fruits, first fruits, and Christians everywhere must learn forgiveness in our lifetimes in order to teach people in the millennium so they can learn to forgive others. Turn to 1 Thessalonians 4.16. And before, while you're turning there, 1 Thessalonians 4.16, the greatest person I ever knew personally that was forgiving was my mother. She was an orphan. And some of the things she went through, I don't think I could have ever forgave. But she set a fine example, and I had a wonderful mother. Turn to verse 16. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, and with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Turn to Isaiah 2, verse 3. Isaiah 2, verse 3. Isaiah 2, beginning verse 3. And many people shall go and say, Come ye, and let us go to the mount of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us of his ways, and we will walk in his path. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Um, sometimes you, I'm having a little trouble seeing, but I'm doing the best I can. <laughs> okay. In the millennium, we will be teaching humans how to forgive. How to forgive as we learn to forgive in our lifetimes. And God and us will teach his ways. And one of the greatest ways is a way of forgiveness. God forgives and humans must learn to forgive. But it's not without precedent. Let's look at another story about forgiveness. Turn to Genesis 50, verses 14 through 21. Genesis 50, verses 14 through 21. Genesis 50, beginning in verse 14. And Joseph returned to Egypt, he and his brethren, and all that went up with him to bury his father, after he had buried his father, Verse 15, and when Joseph's brethren saw that their father was dead, they said, Joseph will preadventure hate us and will certainly requite us all the evil which we have did unto him. Verse 16, and they sent a messenger unto Joseph, saying, Thy father did command before he died, saying, verse 17, so shall he say unto Joseph, Forgive, I pray thee now, the trespass of thy brethren and their sin, for they did unto thee evil. And now we pray the forgive, the trespass of the servants of the living God and of thy father. And Joseph wept when they spake unto him. Verse 18. And his brethren also went and fell down before his face. And they said, Behold, we be thy servants. Verse 19. And Joseph said unto them, Fear not, for am I in the place of God? Sometimes when we don't forgive... We are in the place of God. Don't ever let that happen. If we can't forgive, we're taking the place of God. Don't ever let that happen. Verse 20, but as for you, ye thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good, to bring to pass, as is this day, to save much people alive. Verse 21, now therefore fear ye not, I will nourish you and your little ones. And he comforted them and spake kindly unto them. Bitterness is a force of destruction and bondage. It destroys people and relationship. It makes us prisoners of our hurts and hatred. I know 
because I've been there before. Maybe you have too if you're honest. It's hard to forgive. Job 21, verse 23 and 25. Job 21, 23 and 25. Verse 23. One dieth in his full strength, being holy in ease and quiet. Verse 25. And another die in the bitterness of his soul, and never eateth with pleasure. I've seen people ate up with hate and unforgiveness, and just like it says here, it really is true. Forgiveness is the source of emotional health and freedom. It has the power to set us free from the hurts of the past, whether you're talking about 10 minutes ago or 10 years ago. Forgiveness frees us to love those who have hurt us. As we read in Genesis 50, 14 through 21, Joseph's brothers had acted out of hatred, verse 20, ye thought evil against me. Joseph did not deny the sinful nature of his brother's actions, yet Joseph had refused to let their actions turn him into a bitter man. Joseph had responded to their hurts with forgiveness because he understood some important principles. Only God has a right to punish another for the wrongs they do. Am I in the place of God? Verse 19. His brothers had sinned against him. Their actions were unjustifiable. Joseph doesn't make any excuse for their behavior. He understood that they were accountable to God for their actions, not to him. And I hope we remember that. Forgiveness is an act of out of not God, but our will, in which we give up the right to hold another person accountable for the wrongs they have done to us. It means releasing that person from any obligation to ever make things right to me or you. Joseph understood that God can overrule our hurts, even turning instances of pain into good. God meant it unto good. The actions of his brothers were not good. The results in his life were not good, but God's work was good. Because Joseph had forgiven his brothers, he could comfort and speak kindly to them. And if you ever forgive one or someone, remember that. Speak kindly to them. Forgiveness frees us to love those that have hurt us. We don't excuse the behavior or deny our hurt. We simply choose by an act of our will to give up the right to make them pay for the wrong they have done. The alternative is to spend our days in bondage to destructive habits of bitterness. Forgiveness frees us from the destruction habits of a bitter soul. Turn to Ephesians 4, 26 through 32. Ephesians 4, 26 through 32. Ephesians 4, verse 26. Be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath or your anger. Verse 27. Now, for I go on, I have been guilty of that. And it's caused a lot of trouble in my life. And maybe you have been guilty of that. Get rid of that anger. Not only will it be better for you, but it will be better for other people. Don't let the sun go down in your anger. Verse 27, neither give place to, to the devil. Verse 28, let him that stole still no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands, the thing which is good that he may have to give to him that needeth. That's what my mother taught us. It is more blessed to give your time, your money. And my mom and dad did give. And they were blessed. And I tell you, if you give and you help people and you can forgive, you will be blessed. Verse 29. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good, to the use of edifying, that it may be minister grace unto the hearers. I do want to comment here. I've been around men and women in the church and other churches over the years. And it's all right to joke. But my son was hurt by someone I gave him this talk before I came here. He was hurt because someone had said something trying to help him, but it broke his heart. And you've got to be careful what you say, even jokingly, because you can destroy another person. And remember that. Verse 30, 
and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Verse 31, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking but a pray put away from you with all malice. Verse 32, and be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. That's especially for Christians. I've seen Christians hold grudges against one another, talk about one another, and you would think, have they ever really been converted? But what can I say? I've done the same thing. And I hope nobody thought that of me. But we could ask God to forgive us and to not do these things, to be tenderhearted, forgiving. It isn't a thing. You don't have to be a woman. You can be a man and a strong man. Some of the strongest men I ever knew were forgiving men, men that told people, I'm sorry, told people I wasn't kind. Unforgiven offenses give Satan a place in our lives. The word place means a small area of occupancy and jurisdiction. When Satan gains a place in our lives, he keeps us in bondage. He is in charge of us. To act selfishly, we try to get our needs meant the wrong way. To speak hatefully, to, to live carnally, even Christians do that sometimes. Many Christians have knelt to the creator God of this universe, Yahweh, our Father, asking God to forgive them for their bitter and hateful actions, often promising to be different, but they can't because Satan still has a place in their lives that he claims as his own because of past unforgiven offenses. I looked up a lot of scriptures, I did a lot of thought about this sermon, and I'm not talking down to anyone that hears this sermon or anyone that's sitting in this room. I, I have been guilty of these things. I have had to spend hours asking God to help me forgive others and to forgive myself. So I'm not preaching toward anyone, I'm preaching for all of us. But they can't because Satan still has a place in their lives that he claims as his own because of past unforgiven offenses. The symptoms of unforgiving spirit, some of the emotional systems are bitterness, deeply felt resentment, wrath, extreme anger, rage. And lots of times you have that wrath and that rage around the people that you love the most. I have, and I've had to spend hours repenting and I know others but we got to do it if we're going to be in the kingdom if we're going to help God teach then we better learn it now because we can help people now and we got a big job in the millennium so let's try to learn this anger mild displeasure behavior system symptoms clamor a need to talk about the person or offense Keep bringing it up. Even if you were right, so what? I've learned over the years, so what? What difference did it make? I was right. I have a right to be God. Didn't Jesus Christ die for us all, and especially Christians, and every person on the face of this earth? No, you don't say what they did was good, or what you did was good, or who's right, but you've got to forgive, or we can't be sons of God. Evil speaking, any kind of hateful speech, point out faults, criticism, malice, to intentionally harm, get even. We can ask God to forgive these things, and he will. But until we forgive those who have hurt us, Satan will still control a part of our life, and we will continue to be enslaved to these destructive habits of bitterness. Forgiveness, God's way to freedom. We can forgive because we have been forgiven. The key to forgiveness is to focus on what God has done for you. Be able to teach others in the kingdom of God how God forgave you of your sins and how you learn to forgive others. As God forgave gave us, 
free the undeserving, we are to forgive those who have hurt us. Perhaps you have never received the forgiveness of sins that God has provided in his son, Yeshua, Jesus Christ, our Lord. He will never be able to give those who have hurt us until we have experienced the forgiveness of God, our sins forgiven. God longs for us to accept Jesus Christ as Savior and know the forgiveness of our sins. And he longs for Christians who have accepted Jesus Christ as Savior to be led by his Spirit. You know the fruits of the Holy Spirit? And those fruits of the Holy Spirit of love, joy, peace, faith, kindness, gentleness, goodness, temperance, self-control, meekness, we're to be using those toward people that have done us wrong as well as the people have done us right. God requires that, not C.A. Folan, not any church, but God Almighty and Jesus Christ, his son. And if we're gonna be in that wonderful kingdom that we're celebrating, we better learn to forgive and help others and let God's spirit direct us. Jesus died in our place that we might be saved and be in the kingdom of God and help others to be converted or saved. Steps to freedom, seek forgiveness from God. Confess our own bitterness, our selfish actions, hateful speech, carnal living. And it might even be in your own family or people who have died. You've got to confess that. You've got to confess before God. Agree with God that our feelings of bitterness, wrath, malice, and so forth have no place in our lives as a Christian. Thank God for the blood of Christ that cleansed you from your sin, all sin, no matter how bad. Some of you may have been sexually uh, abused or perhaps a beaten or terrible things that I know people have gone through. That doesn't mean you forget and make that sin good. No. You confess before God to help you, not them. But you've got to do this. Forgive our offenders. As an act of our will, not God's will, our will, in faith before God, but willing to forgive them, even if they don't want to be forgiven or have not asked to be forgiven, we still must forgive. Release them from any obligation to make things right. Don't hold anything against them. Extend to them the same grace God has given us, saved by grace, beyond our understanding. Well, sometimes forgiveness is beyond our understanding. But by the grace of God, we can do it. And I don't care whether you're a child, an adult, a woman, or a man. We all need to learn to forgive. If we're going to be in the kingdom of God and teach others to forgive. Because we're going to have people that have gone through wars and famine and all kinds of hell. And it's going to be the wonderful world tomorrow. But if we can't give them hope and be with our God and teach these people that they can overcome the things that have happened to them. Some of them will have been raped. Some of them will have been beaten. Some of them will have their parents killed. They'll have terrible things. And if we can't show that we forgave and with God all things are possible, how in the world are we going to teach them to forgive and to make a new world, the world tomorrow, and on into eternity. We've got to learn to forgive. When we are willing to forgive those who have wronged us, we no longer allow Satan to have a place in our lives. I learned that personally. For years, I had some unforgiving attitudes, and it even helped hurt me physically. Some of the physical problems I think I have today is because I didn't forgive. Forgiveness not only helps others, but it helps you. I know from experience. Perhaps God has brought someone to your mind that you need to forgive. Purpose to do it right now in your mind, and then later before God asks you, Ask him to help you forgive that person. It may be a member, a family member, or a person from your past. Why not come today and determine that you will forgive as Christ has forgave us? 
You might say, but it happened such a long time ago. It no longer matters. Well, if you can remember it, and you know that you have never scripturally forgiven that person, then you need to do it now. Remember, you're not asking God to forgive anyone. You are doing the forgiving with God as your witness and God as your help through the Holy Spirit. Do it for yourself and for the people you will teach in the kingdom of God. Turn to Micah 6 8. Micah 6 8. Micah 6 verse 8. He has showed thee, O man, what is good, and what doth the Lord require of thee but to do justly, and to love mercy, and to walk humbly with thy God. Our ability to love mercy, our ability to forgive, is a major of our character. I'll repeat that. Our ability to forgive is a measure of our character. You want godly character? You'll never have it. Not until you learn to forgive. We must develop character now to teach others forgiveness in the kingdom of God. There is yet one more story that also defines human reasoning about forgiving. Before Jesus came to earth as a man, he was called the Word. Turn to John 1.1. 1, 1. John 1.1. 1, 1. John verse 1. Verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He later became a human being. In the same chapter, John 1, 14, verse 14. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus Christ then allowed Himself to be killed. What folly, might, one might think. Why would He want to subject Himself to this? There was a great purpose in it. The Apostle Paul explained it in Philippians 2, that exemplified the kind of thinking we ourselves should have. Turn to Philippians 2. That's one of my favorite books in the Bible. Philippians 2, verses 5 and 6. Philippians 2, 5 and 6. We'll start in verse 5. Let this mind be in you, which also was in Christ Jesus. Verse 6. Who being in the form of God, fought it rob not robbery to be equal with God. Instead, Jesus emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. Verse 7 in that same chapter, Philippians 2, 7. But made himself of no reputation, and took up him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. Verse 8. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. A huge debt has been forgiven us. Every person on this earth owes God their life because God gave his only begotten son for us. A debt we could never hope to repay. Our debt can only be paid with our life, either living for Satan or living for God. However, Jesus came into our lives and paid that debt for us. In this state of grace with our God, shall we not be able to forgive Christ was blameless, perfect, and innocent. He did nothing wrong, sinful, or illegal. Many among the jealous, self-righteous, hypocritical Jewish leadership of the time continuously sought to discredit Jesus and plotted how they could kill him. All the while, Christ preached to large crowds, fed thousands, answered questions with impeccable wisdom. He healed hundreds, if not thousands, of people and perform many other miracles. The envy and hatred of those in the religious establishment toward him was mind-boggling. In the end, they had him killed. At the very end of Jesus' earthly life, he left these words to all who heard him. From religious leaders to the shouting mobs demanding his cru crucifixion to the Roman officials and mocking soldiers, Father, forgive them. For they do not know what they do. Luke 21, 23, 34. Keep that in mind. Luke 23, 34. How unjust and how undeserved. What can we learn from these stories? Turn to Matthew 5, 44. Matthew 5, verse 44. Verse 44. 
Verse 44, but I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. We learn to pray for others. That's what we must do as Christians. Turn to Matthew 6, 12. Matthew 6, 12. There in Matthew 6, verse 12. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. He underscored this focus just after giving the prayer outline in Matthew 6, 14 and 15. Verse 14. For if ye forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. Verse 15. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive you your trespasses. This is not C.A. Folden. C.A. Folden is a little piece of dirt that lives on this earth. But I'm thankful that God gives me life. This is the word of God. This is for all of us. We must, we must forgive. We have to forgive. All of us have been hurt by someone else's actions or words. Vengeful acts are often committed against those close at hand. It can be criticism, betrayal, misunderstandings, and even well-meaning thoughts that nonetheless cause offense and bring anger and pain. It might be reflective self-defense. If these feelings are not dealt with, they can grow bigger and bigger and bloom far out of proportion to the original slight. To the point of consuming us, forgiveness frees us from that encumbrance. I'm so saddened when I see people harbor ill will, oftentimes for years, over insults and actions of the past. They just can't move past it, perhaps feeling that letting go will memonize what happened. Yet forgiveness does not lessen the wrong that was done. Rather, it releases us from the grip of consuming thoughts of injustice. And isn't that true today? Don't we have protests and people in the streets burning and killing sometimes and breaking windows because of injustice? We've all had injustice. We've all been slaves to society, to sin. You'll never get pure justice. Like my mother said, things she was through. The people that did things to her, they're dead and gone. You'll never get justice. Only God can give justice. Don't be bitter. Don't think that you have to have justice. Because in this world, there's no justice. We're looking for a world where there'll be justice. But we have to learn to forgive and care for people and reach out. Forgiveness is a vital component in our physical, mental, emotional, and especially spiritual health. The act of forgiveness goes beyond relationship issues with those around us. We may be trapped in guilt and shame for our own past sins. I have for years. Maybe you have too. We may have done terrible things or been guilty of gross neglect in the past that still jars us. We may have neglected our marriage our children, our friends, and feel guilty years on because we recall James 4.17. Remember James 4.17? Therefore, to him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is sin. Remember that. Some things we've done cannot be undone or put right, but we can be forgiven with a sin removed from our record. In such cases, the only path to wholeness is through forgiveness and trusting in God's promises, his word, while committing to live right and help those we've hurt in whatever way possible, even if they're dead. Even if they're dead, you can show respect to family, other people, and remember, if you repent of it, even if they're dead, you can be forgiven. Finding and granting freedom. Whatever it is, go to God to gain freedom from the past. If we've confessed our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 1 John 1, 9. What a blessing it is to be free of guilt and stand fresh before God and men. We have seen that forgiveness can be extended in even most difficult circumstances, such as the Amish school shooting. 
that would be rough. We must further realize a great deal has been forgiven us. What others owe us is small, small in comparison. Always remember what Jesus endured in choosing to pay the debt we incurred for sins and recognize that it was he killed, necessitated by the sin of every one of us. He said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Let us send the same mercy as Paul wrote in Ephesians 4.32. And we'll end there. If you have your Bibles, make sure you turn to Ephesians 4.32. Ephesians 4.32. Verse 32. And be ye kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, as even for God, for Christ's sake, have forgiven you. If we as Christians in this lifetime can learn how to forgive, then we will be able to teach others in the kingdom of God how to forgive others. Let Christ be our example. Amen. And let us look forward to the time when all will be forgiven. <laughs>